Good morning and welcome to our worship here at St John's Greenhill. I hope that you are well and uh, ready and uh, looking forward to worshipping with us as we come into the presence of the Lord. Uh, today we'll be looking at a strange story in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus encounters a foreigner, uh, someone who is not part of his culture. And there is an interaction there which I hope we can learn from and uh, see what Jesus is trying to teach us there. But shall we come before God now and still our hearts, just prepare um, our thinking and our consciousness to be in the presence of God and putting aside other things which may distract, perhaps the weather, uh, perhaps the situation, or maybe what faces you tomorrow. The psalmist writes in Psalm 67, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that his ways may be known on earth and his salvation among all nations. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God offers to take our burden of sin away. He wants us to be in right relationship with him. So let us turn to him in penitence and faith and humbly confess our sins together. And we pray this prayer. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. So we respond to that forgiveness in worship and in adoration of God. So we're going to say the words of this piece of liturgy, which we call the Gloria. Now we would normally sing this, but um, as we are uh, online, we will say it together. and The words should appear on your screen. So we pray. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, that they may obtain their petitions, make them ask such things as shall please you, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we're going to have our Bible readings. The reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. I ask them, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite a descendant of Abraham. 
a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people who he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you yourself were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you and also with you. Hear the Gospel of Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you for uh, bringing those readings to us. I'm going to focus on our gospel reading, the one from Matthew, where we have two passages sitting side by side. One statement is about uh, what makes a person holy or unholy, what makes them defiled in the eyes of God. Um, in the context that we're witnessing here, we're talking about Jewish law, first century Jewish law, which had a great deal to say, as I'm sure you know, about food laws, about diet, and the idea that you became defiled or unholy, unworthy and unclean by eating the wrong thing. And what Jesus said, to put it in a nutshell, is that this has got nothing to do with it. It makes no difference to your holiness in the sight of God whatsoever. But you are defiled and you are made unclean by what you think, say and do, by your own choices and reactions. And while that may sound like good news, you, you can't be uh, wrong in the sight of God by breaking the religious ritual, the practice or the law that's put in its place is actually harder because you could be faultless in your religious practice. 
but still in the eyes of God be at fault because your th thoughts, words and deeds, particularly that which comes out of your mouth, is not glorifying to him. And the story that follows this, one thing after another, is uh, a conversation between Jesus and another person. And it's a, a human situation, an encounter. And this is where Jesus models for us certain behaviour, as does the other person. And I want to see what we can learn from that. First of all, context, background and tradition. We are undoubtedly affected by our context, where we were born, how we were raised, the culture in which we live. These things greatly affect how we think and we learn from them what is right and what is wrong. In other words, we form a view or are or given a view about what defiles us, what makes us right or wrong. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, were the same. They were all Jewish. They all obeyed the Jewish law. So when Jesus says that what that they eat makes no difference to their uh, status in the eyes of God, it doesn't defile them. It's a very radical statement that would have been very difficult for them to hear because their entire past would be built on the assumption that what you ate really did matter. But what Jesus says is that the religious law, the traditions, the rituals and the diet laws were really only there to point you to God. They were an aid memoir. What matters were that was their choices in the face of real human situations. So lo and behold, as soon as he teaches that, we're brought in the narrative to a real life situation, which puts it to the test. And for some reason, Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, you just look on a biblical map, you'll see where these places are. They're way over on the coast and, and a long way northeast of Galilee. Um, this is what is what at the time was known as Phoenicia. Jesus is a long way from home, not just geographically, but culturally as well. This is Gentile territory, so there was a racial and religious tension to this encounter. And Matthew, the writer in this case, chooses to emphasise this difference by referring to the woman in the story as a Canaanite woman, a woman of Canaan. He doesn't use the contemporary term, which Luke does use, which is Syro-Phoenician woman. So why is Matthew stressing the word Canaanite? Well, he wants to maximise the difference between Jesus and the woman. He wants to stress the gulf between them. And ultimately he's saying that that gulf didn't matter, but he's maximising our awareness of what that gulf is. The word Canaanite stresses not just the Jew-Gentile difference, but the many, many centuries of historical enmity between the original inhabitants of the land of Palestine and the Hebrews, the Jews who travelled from Egypt under the leadership of Moses and then Joshua and took possession of the land. And of course, finally, the woman is, well, she's a woman. She is the wrong gender. There were social conventions at work here, especially concerning the appropriateness of a woman of any rank approaching a man in the street and engaging him in a conversation, let alone desperate pleading for help. So this encounter between Jesus and the Canaanite woman breaks all the rules. She's the wrong nationality. She has the wrong history. She has the wrong faith and beliefs and practices, and she is the wrong gender. So all of those things are broken. They're all faux pas in this story. So the interesting thing is, how do these two people respond in this encounter? Firstly, the disciples of Jesus act according to that conditioning. Their background, their teaching, their customs, their tradition, everything they took to be true teaches them to say, Jesus, send her away, make her go. This is not appropriate. What we see from the story is when we respond that way, purely out of culture, out of habit, out of ingrained prejudice and disregard, that is what Jesus means by 
what comes out of our mouth defiles us. That is wrong. It is sin. It is unloving. It is ungracious. It is not how God is. And that lets us down. We let ourselves down when we follow the rules of our conventions, especially if they are in contradiction to what God is teaching us. And even if these Jewish boys, these disciples, were able to keep their precious food laws in Tyre and Sidon, and that has to be doubtful, then it was their attitudes that defiled them anyway uh, because of their unloving and uh, disregarding stance towards this woman in need. So what does Jesus do? Well, firstly, Jesus does not ignore her. It's a difficult dialogue, but nevertheless, he engages her in a dialogue. He is not going to judge her until he has evidence on which to do so. So the fact that she is a Gentile, that she's a Canaanite, that she's a woman, none of that matters. What he's going to do is test her character. If her character shows that she's not really worthy of any more attention, then he will walk on. But if her character shows that she is a person of faith, he will stop. So he puts her to the test and it's a difficult dialogue. Initially, he seems to be adopting the same stance as the disciples. Firstly, he accepts the fact that he had come to serve and to give to the people of Israel. The Jews were his primary audience, his primary target. He was their Messiah. He had come to them first. So does this woman think she has any status or right or, or, or case to demand attention of any kind? No, because she's not a Jew. But she's not phased by that. So he uses another tactic. He says, well, can I... Um, sort of make her feel unworthy in some way, I'm going to use a racially fused term, which he does. He says it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs, by which he means to take something which is initially a gift to the Gentiles and throw it to, sorry, initially a gift to the Jews and then throw it to the Gentiles. What he actually says, he, he uses a term here, um, which is translated here as little dogs. The, the word dog was something a Jew used to use to refer to a Gentile in a very insulting way. Um, so a lot rests on how this was said, because on the face of it, it's a racially insulting term. Now, he softens it a bit by using the word that was used for a dog which was a house pet rather than a scavenging wild dog. But it's still a harsh thing to say. What we can't see is the body language, the facial expression, or perhaps there was a smile. Maybe he was teasing. But it is a test. It's um, how are you going to react to this bit of pushback? Do you still have the same faith as you had two minutes ago? And what the way she reacts is wonderful. She acknowledges the Lordship of Jesus. She says, Lord, help me. It's an act of worship, not of, not purely one of petition. She acknowledges that she has no rights here, that she is pleading for grace. She just wants mercy and loving kindness. She acknowledges Jesus' identity and even Israel's privilege, but appeals to Jesus' unconditional kindness to heal her demon-possessed daughter. She has faith, she has courage, she has persistence, but also humility and an awareness that Jesus was Lord and that she was requesting, not demanding. And she rests her case simply on Jesus' character. She's simply relying on the fact he loves uh, and is merciful to all people. She makes the assumption that she has the right to come and ask, and she leaves it at that. The way Jesus reacts then is the same as when he saw any person of faith. Great is your faith, 
he says, it will be as you've asked. And her daughter is instantly healed. It reminds me of the centurion and the centurion's servant. I've not seen faith like this in the whole of Israel, Jesus said. Again, another outsider, a Gentile, a pagan. And what does this incident teach us? Well, firstly, the woman on the statements of others decides to have faith. And it's against her cultural conditioning. The, the, the teachings of Messiah and Christ were nothing to do with Syrophoenician culture or Canaanite culture. It was a Jewish thing. Nevertheless, she decided to have faith. She decides, and Jesus vindicates her, in saying that the benefits and power of the kingdom of God are available to anyone. There is no such thing as the right kind of person. There is no right background. There is no right nationality. There is no right upbringing or culture. We are talking about the kingdom of God. It's available for the whole world. The third thing I think this incident teaches us is that when we do come before God, we may yet be tested. Our character may be put through the mill. What Jesus is doing is drawing out a statement of faith from her, but does so initially by being offhand and harsh. So the lesson for us is to examine our motives. Are they pure and true? And to persist and to not let things discourage us when we pray. Be determined and resolute. And finally, we see the example here and the power of humility. She doesn't rise to disappointment or even an apparent insult, but graciously accepts that she is not in a position of power or right or uh, being in a position to demand or insist. But that which she is asking for is loving kindness. Will you be graceful? Will you be gracious? Will you be merciful? And it's an interesting fact, isn't it, that often it's the weakest and the outcast of society who most easily understand who Jesus was. Those in this scene who were mostly obsessed and consumed by status and power and human standards of rightness and purity, they were the ones standing aloof or even saying, send her away. But she refused to believe that Jesus was only sent for certain people and not her. Jesus models for us here that what comes out of your mouth, your reactions and your decisions are what make the difference, not the legalistic rituals you follow. He doesn't allow what comes out of his heart and mouth to let him down, no matter what cultural pressure there was to walk on by and ignore this woman. He pays the woman enough respect to draw out of her the sincerity of her position. He doesn't say yes straight away. He tests her character. But when she responds with faith, he responds with power. Now it may be that you are uncertain about how to approach God, how to bring something in prayer to God. There may be a million things here that are bothering uh, you or the, or the rest of the people watching this talk. But whatever it is, examine your motives. Recognize that you are asking for mercy and love. You're not claiming a right. And come humbly before your God, but do so in faith and persistence. For God will answer. The answer may be a long time coming and you may well experience both testing and discouragement in the short run. But resolve now to be praying for the same thing this time next week, maybe next month, maybe even longer and see what God will do. Read for yourself this little incident, maybe read up on the background of it. Maybe you'll understand the gulf between them in human cultural terms and how that gulf was rendered as nothing 
by Jesus' response, but also by her statement of faith. Amen. Well, let's uh, join together in our statement of faith, which is the creed and expression of what Christians have always believed, as we say this together. Will you join with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we will be led in our prayers and intercessions. So shall we bow our heads and join in our pleadings with God to bless our world, our culture, our community and our church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, search our hearts and root out any hypocrisy you can find there so that the words of our mouths may reflect hearts that honour you in thought, word and motive. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our lives and live out your life. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. And always guide us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, thank you for the wonderful compassion that Jesus showed to the Samaritan woman who came to understand that the Jewish Messiah was the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is our savior too. Thank you that by grace through faith in him, we have received forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. Continue to open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your word and guide us into all truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, during this pandemic, we pray for our scientists who are leading the race to understand this disease and communicate its gravity. God, give them knowledge, wisdom, and a persuasive voice. We pray for our elected officials as they allocate the necessary resources to contain the spread of infection. We pray for our vulnerable communities, as well as the young and strong, that they will exercise the necessary caution to avoid spreading the disease. For those with mental health challenges who feel isolated, anxious and helpless, God, provide them every necessary support. For international travelers, travelers stuck in foreign countries, God, help them to return home safely and quickly. For Christian missionaries throughout the world, especially in areas with high rates of infection, God, provide them with words of hope and equip them to love and serve those around them. For workers in a variety of industries facing layoffs and financial hardship, God, keep them from panic and provide the means to support them. For families with young children at home for the foreseeable future, 
and for parents who cannot stay home from work but must find care for their children. God, present them with creative solutions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of goodness and love, hear our prayers for the sick members of our community and for all who are in need. Show your mercy as you close wounds, cure illness, make broken bodies whole and free downcast spirits. May these special people find lasting health and deliverance and so join us in thanking you for all your gifts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, who redeems our life and who has shed our flesh and blood, we thank you that our lives are precious in your sight. We pray in thanksgiving for all who have died, that their memory may be blessed among us and that their loved ones will be comforted in the sure hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of St. John the Baptist and all your saints, we commend ourselves and all Christian people to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are now uh, approaching the time when we will share uh, the Eucharist together. If you'd like to join with bread and wine, please go and make ready your um, the, uh, the elements, the wine and the bread. In the meantime, we will share the peace together. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. And as we do that, we will listen to some music which will uh, offer us a chance to meditate and pray to God before we share in the Eucharist. draw close to the table as we come to uh, the Eucharist that we share in the body and blood of Christ. We do so as one body, though we may be separate. We are joined together by the Spirit. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Living God, Father of light, hope of nations, friend of sinners, builder of the city that is to come, your love is made visible in Jesus Christ. 
you bring home the lost, restore the sinner, and give dignity to the despised. In the face of Jesus Christ, your light shines out, flooding lives with goodness and truth, gathering into one a divided and broken humanity, with people from every race and nation, with the church of all the ages, with apostles, evangelists and martyrs, we join the angels of heaven in their unending song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, shared it with them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took a cup of wine. Again, he gave you thanks, shared it and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, as we remember all that Jesus did, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth and your kingdom comes. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to be with you forever at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours. A loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. And we say together, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ.
keep you in eternal life. Amen. God of our pilgrimage, you have willed that the gate of mercy should stand open for those who trust in you. Look upon us with your favour, that we who follow the path of your will may never wander from the way of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, uh, thank you for worshipping with us. Um, just a couple of things to say. Firstly, we continue to meet at 9 a.m. in person in church. If you are at the point where you feel that that is for you, then please join us on a Sunday morning. Uh, we are not yet offering the Eucharist at that service. That may change. But for the moment, it's a simple service of the word. It lasts roughly half an hour just over. Um, you'll be on your way home again by about 20 to 10, um, and you will be very welcome. Secondly, uh, although I am here in, in spirit with you, I am in fact on holiday at the moment, and I will be away for two weeks. I will be away for uh, two more Sundays after this one. I'll be back to work on September the 1st. So Ajay uh, is uh, in charge while I'm away, and, and David, uh, Burn Father David, will be helping him. So if you've got any urgent uh, issues, please do go to them because I will be uh, away uh, for a fortnight. But let us still our hearts as we uh, come to receive God's blessing as we depart this, this space together and go back into the world. The Lord be with you. May God, who gives patience and encouragement, give you a spirit of unity to live in harmony as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.